All right. We need to get started. Um, what we do here is uh, try to do as teachers in this class is go according to this schedule that our Bible reading schedule for the church. Yeah. And um, of course, we just began in the Revelation, so. Um, Friday and Saturday was uh, Revelation chapters 4 and 5. So this morning we'll be looking at uh, chapters 4 and 5, but mostly 5. We have to look at 4 just to have the groundwork for it. Uh, there are papers on the table that has the text in for chapter 5 in the New Living Translation. And if you have your Bibles, I will be asking you to look up some verses at some point during this. So, if you haven't started yet, here's the reading schedule, and it's aggressive, but it's good. And uh, I've been doing it for several years, that same schedule. So, um, let's begin our time then with prayer. Heavenly Father, I just come to you this morning. Um, on behalf of all these folks who are gathered in this room today. And we're here today, Lord Jesus, to um, consider a portion of your word, which you gave to us by your spirit. And we, we need wisdom as we look at it, uh, this text. And uh, we, we want to know what you're saying, and we want it to understand what it means and especially like uh, the Apostle Paul uh, we like to know you more and more Lord Jesus and like the pastor said this morning in the sermon to love you uh, with with all of our hearts we just need to learn and be better at that Lord I just pray pray that as we look at the word that you'll um, <laughs> do things in our heart that will help us as well. I pray for everyone who's come into this room this morning. I know that there's not a day that passes it where there are not some issues that we face each day, some very, very hard, and some just normal, and sometimes we just don't feel good. But I just pray, God, that you'll lift the spirits of every person in this room this morning up to you. In Jesus' name I pray these things. Amen. Amen. Okay, um, the Revelation, um, the last book of the Bible, uh, is, a, is the only book I can think of in the Bible that opens up with uh, this, this idea of, of a blessing, if you read it. And it's uh, verse 3 of the chapter 1 of the Revelation. God blesses the one who reads the words of this prophecy to the church. And he blesses all who listen to its message and obey what it says, for the time is near. You know the Bible was meant to be read out loud. That's how it was given to us. And um, so sometimes if you can just hear it, maybe listen to it sometimes while you're driving in your car. But God blesses the one who reads the words of this prophecy to the church. So if you want a blessing, uh, read, the, read the Revelation. Um, Karen and I have friends in Florida, and um, they're, they're uh, musicians who are professional musicians who are Christians, and uh, they're, they're Billy Dean and Dawn Birch. And um, uh, boy, I tell you, if you want to ever hear a marvelous singer, this, this gal, and he's a wonderful musician. He plays piano and saxophone and everything, and they're just amazing. But anyway, we were down there just a few years ago, and we were with them, and she said, I'm going to memorize the book of Revelation. And she did. She literally memorized the entire book of the Revelation. And so I'm sure she's surely blessed by God having done that. Now, especially for those who teach or preach or uh, present the word, 
the, the writer of the Revelation was very good to us, very nice to us, because he gave us an outline. You know, and that's the thing that most teachers and preachers look for, an outline. Well, here it is. It's in the 19th verse of chapter 1 of Revelation. He says, write down what you have seen, both the things that are now happening and the things that will happen. So what you have seen, of course, is the past. And he was talking to the churches, you know, in the first uh, three chapters. And uh, then the things that the present, the things that are now happening. And that's what we'd be looking at today. And then the future are the things that will happen. And that's, there's a lot of that in the Revelation as well. Um, now here's something that you may or may not know. That those who teach and preach the Bible spend far, far more time, exponentially far more time on the first three chapters of Revelation and perhaps the last two than they do the rest of the book. Because they'll go this far and they get to chapter four and then... Uh, and uh, are you still upright? Okay. <laughs> they get to chapter four and then this sound comes up. But what happens is... Uh, I'm going to move this down just a slight, just to help a little. And so um, uh, these are the verses in between, like say up to chapter 18, like chapters 4, 5, or 6, up to 18, all that in there is just too crazy, you know. So most so, so no many people, not very many people go there. Now, um, I want us to consider a little bit chapters 4 and 5 this morning. And we'll go, I want to just go through chapter 4 uh, more quickly and then get more into chapter 5. Uh, really, I think before chapters were given and put into the Bible, I think 4 and 5 were just really one chapter, but that's the way it is. So you'll find in chapter 4 that the, the, um, they'll be talking about God when they worship, you know, and give order. Then in, in chapter 5, you'll see more it's directed toward Jesus Christ. That's about the two differences in those two chapters. So let's begin. Chapter 4 begins, Then as I looked, I'm just reading this from the New Living Translation. Then as I looked, I saw a door standing open in heaven, and the same voice I had heard before spoke to me like a trumpet blast. The voice says, come up here, and I will show you what must happen after this. And instantly, I, this is John speaking, I was in the Spirit, and I saw a throne in heaven and someone sitting on it. Oh, man. Amen. What a sight. I just, you know, our minds can't comprehend they, they use this language, you know, of trying to describe things. Imagine being caught up. Now, here's what uh, some have struggled with, what it means to be uh, in the spirit. Uh, some, is it, is it more, uh, you know, something that uh, charismatic thing or this or that? Let me explain it a little bit. Um, before, uh, before I do, though, let me just say this. Um, when you go from the chapter 3 to chapter 4, okay, you've been talking about the churches, but that's a really great stuff. And then uh, he says he hears a voice saying, come up here in chapter 4. Now many teach, and I have been taught this over my lifetime that that means the rapture of the church happens at the beginning of chapter 4. Uh, I believe it re refers mostly to John because he's telling John to come up here but in a, in a more general way uh, it could have something to do with the rapture of church because I believe the rapture of the church happens before the uh, it, things that happen during the tribulation period. Um, <coughs> Uh, another reason uh, I believe that it's the rapture of the church is because the church is not mentioned anymore after chapter 3. 
You have 16 times the church is mentioned in those first three chapters, and then you go, no mention at all, as it goes on toward the end to, to like chapter 18 or so, and then it talks about the future. That's going to be the church's things that are going to be happened. I mean, how crazy is that there are 16 references to the church in the first three chapters and then zero references uh, after that. And I believe it's because the church is caught up uh, in, into heaven. Now, I know this. <laughs> I know it in a church this size, and especially in an evangelical free church, uh, you're going to have differences of opinion on... Uh, eschatology, the things of the future. You just are. And, and even these, you wonderful folks in this room who love each other, like the pastor said this morning, we should love each other, may disagree as to what point in eschatology that the rapture will occur. And that's okay. I don't think we should um, get in a fist fight over that. Okay. All right. Now, um, and instantly I was in the Spirit, John says. Instantly I was in the Spirit. And I believe at that moment that John was uh, absolutely and fully controlled by the Holy Spirit. Completely controlled by the Holy Spirit. That he was physically moved from where he was to heaven, wherever that is. That he was awake. That he was alert. And... He was seeing things that no man had ever seen and lived to talk about it. You know, sometimes you, you can go to the Apostle Paul who was caught up in the third heaven. But I think this is just a little bit different here because he was brought to the throne room. And, uh, and that's, that's how I see that. And verse 2 continues, And I saw a throne in heaven and someone sitting on it the one sitting on the throne was as brilliant as gemstones, like jasper and carnelian, and the glow of an emerald circled his throne like a rainbow. Twenty-four thrones surrounded him, and twenty-four elders sat on them. They were all clothed in white and had gold crowns on their heads. These are the twenty-four elders. These are the church. These represent the church. This is another reason that I believe the church was raptured up. Uh, the elders of the church is what they are. And the promises uh, for the church was white uh, robes and white raiment. And uh, they've been raptured to heaven, up into heaven. Verse 5 says, From the throne came flashes of lightning and rumble of thunder, and in front of the throne were seven torches with burning flames. This is the sevenfold spirit of God. We'll hear that phrase through this, the sevenfold spirit of God. This represents the Holy Spirit in its entirety. Seven is complete. When you see the number seven, almost every time it has to do with completeness. Um, and verse six says, in front of the throne was a shiny sea of glass sparkling like crystal. In the center and around the throne were four living beings, each covered with eyes, front and back. Now this is really, these, these uh, you've seen these before. If you read in Ezekiel, for instance, you see these, these uh, beings that, uh, that have the different faces, you know, the, the bull and the lion and the man and the eagle. And they're really weird. I mean, they're just really different and they're full of eyes. What do you think that represents when it says they're full of eyes? All seeing. <clears throat> Pardon? All seeing God. All seeing, yes, which uh, in uh, theological terms, what would that be? Uh, omnipresence. Omniscience, yes. Omniscience, it means that he knows everything, you know, he sees everything. No darkness. Yeah, and, uh, you know, it's, it's something to think about uh, every day. Yes, sir. You know, those are cameras and drones. Yeah. I think that uh, heaven's far more advanced than our technology down here. John is trying to see here. Yeah. I've never seen this before. Right. Yeah. 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 Um, right. 
Uh, of course, he was living a long time ago. But uh, so verse 7 says, the first of these living beings was like a lion, the second was like an ox, the third had a human face, the fourth was like an eagle in flight. These uh, creatures are all at the top level of whatever they represent, yeah. each of these creatures. Verse 8, each of these living beings had six wings and their wings were covered all over with eyes, inside and out. Day after day and night after night, they, kept, they keep on saying, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord God, the Almighty, the one who always was, who is, and who is still to come. Verse 9, whenever the living beings give glory and honor, and thanks to the one sitting on the throne, the one who lives forever and ever, the 24 elders fall down and worship the one sitting on the throne, the one who lives forever and ever. And they lay their crowns before the throne and say, You are worthy, O Lord our God, to receive glory and honor and power. For you created all things, and they exist because you created what you please. And you've no doubt, if you've been in the church very long, sung some of these songs about that. Thou art worthy. Have you ever sang, Thou art worthy, Thou art worthy. My wife says, don't sing. Uh, and, um, or, uh, worthy is the lamb that was, was slain. Worthy is the lamb that was slain. You know, beautiful. Yeah. It's in our hymn books out here. So that's the, that's the fourth chapter. Now I want us to move into the fifth chapter, uh, verse 1. Then I saw a scroll in the right hand of the one who was sitting on the throne. There was writing on the inside and the outside of the scroll, and it was sealed with seven seals. Now I got a scroll here. Um, it's not a real scroll, okay? I, I made this out of a roll of paper in my shop and uh, some string with uh, seven strings and I even used wax to to seal them so none of you can break in here <laughs> but there would be but there would be writing on the outside as well as writing on the inside of the scroll and uh, that was unusual to have writing on the outside yeah. it was only done when it was exceptionally important thing. In fact, um, let me see here. I think I might have a, I might have that. Um, yeah, George, do you have Ezekiel 2, 9 and 10 there? I do. Yes, read that. Then I, then I took and saw a hand reaching out to me. It held a scroll, which was unrolled and and I saw that both sides were covered with funeral songs, words of sorrow, and pronouncements of doom. Yeah, pronouncements of doom. So he, that was written on both sides, so it was exceptionally important there in Ezekiel. The seven seals on here uh, mean that the message is not only important, but that it is complete with seven, seven of them. It means it's a complete message. It's all there. And it involves the future of mankind, the future of God's creation. And um, uh, verse 2 says, And I saw a strong angel who shouted with a loud voice, Who is worthy to break the seals on this scroll and open it? And this went out to all creation. This had to be a strong angel. We don't know who it was. There are two archangels who are very strong. Who are they? Michael and Gabriel. Michael and Gabriel. But he had a lot of strong angels. And there was one that probably had a profession, uh, especially loud voice. And the message went out. There was no one who did not hear the message that this angel sent out that, um, uh, that he called. Uh, and I saw a strong angel who shouted with a loud voice, Who is worthy to break the seals on this scroll and open it? And it only, 
Only the ones who had the authority could break the seals of a, of a scroll or any item that was sealed, in, especially in that day. They had to have authority to do that. And uh, they couldn't find anyone. Verse 3, but no one, see that? No one in heaven or on earth or under the earth. What's under the earth mean? Satan. The devil. Yeah, the satanic beings, uh, yeah. all those kinds of things. Any, any being in the entire universe is getting this message. Uh, no one in heaven or on earth or under the earth was able to open the scroll and read it. And um, some commentators have called this scroll the title deed to the earth. I don't personally uh, take that approach. Yes, sir. Yeah, that, that was the question I was going to ask. Yeah. What are the contents of that scroll or uh, book? Is it yeah. the Lamb's Book of Life? Is it the yeah. judgment books of everybody that's lived? Uh, you just line up beside every theologian who's ever studied the Bible. Oh, I'm, I'm in line. Okay. <laughs> and uh, they've all had opinions about this. I'll tell you what I believe. Anyway, um, but uh, I believe it has to do with the future, with what's going to happen to all this that God has created, all up to this point. Now, what's what's when they open it? What's going to happen? to all mankind, to all the promises that we've heard all these years. And no one could answer that question. Now listen, right. get this. this you gotta, you got to really put yourself in John the Apostle's yeah. body and heart and mind and think like he thinks. Um, he cried. It says he wept bitterly. That there's, there's a double emphasis there on his crying. It, 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 he bawled. He, he, he was just so upset. You ever hear a grown man just cry like that? I, when, my, when my mother died, my stepfather had been married to my mother for 20 years, and he just loved her with his whole heart more than you can even imagine. So I stayed out there at the house for a week, and I remember waking up in the morning. I wake up in the morning, and here, here was uh, my stepfather down there. I could hear him all through the house just crying as loud as he could. That went on every day. He was so full of uh, hurt that Mom was gone. And so he wept bitterly. Verse uh, 4, Then I began to weep bitterly because no one was found worthy to open the scroll and read it. The scroll. All the things John had ri written and believed and walked with Jesus and believed about the promises of the future he really see, thinks at this one moment that there's no future. It's all over. Perhaps Satan's going to continue to treat us terribly and have to go on with it's a life like that. Secret, he, he was just, he just devastated be. by this. Now, we're not told how long this goes on. We, they don't give us those times, but probably for a little while because he cried and cried. And, um, and yet found that there, there was no hope. Verse 5, But one of the 24 elders said to me, Stop weeping. Look, the lion of the tribe of Judah, the heir to David's throne, has won the victory. Amen. He is worthy to open the scroll and its seven seals. He won the victory. How do you win the victory? Wonderful. How do you win the victory? On the cross. He, he devastated the enemy on the cross and he won the victory for us so that we could have eternal life and that our sins could be covered forever. He did that. He won the victory. Victory Next Sunday we're going to sing Victory in Jesus, a song that I really like. And, um, okay. And, um, 
course, the elders of the church, they, were, they, they had a close relationship with God, and they were able to speak that, uh, that um, he has won the victory. Now, uh, look, he says, look, the lion of the tribe of Judah, the heir to David's throne, has won the victory. Who is that? Jesus. You know, it's Jesus. He's a lion of the tribe of Judah. And he has won the victory. He is worthy to open the scroll and its seven seals. Now let me ask you, what made Jesus worthy to open the seal? Conquered death. Okay, he conquered death. Right, that's, that's an important aspect of it. Son of God. That he is the, the, the heir, that he is the son of God, absolutely. Because um, some have said, well, it could have been any angel. Angels are, are they don't sin, so well, I wasn't an angel. But when you narrow it down, there's only one that could ever have had the authority and ability. Yes? In, in verse 9, it pretty well explains it, worthy. That's the Lamb, that's Jesus, was slain, did purchase for God with the blood, for thy blood, men from every tribe, tongue, and nation. He Amen. redeemed the world. He, yep. he came to do what he did. Therefore, he could say, that before he ascended, all authority has been given to me. Thank you, Jim. Did, does that make sense? Thank you. Oh. It sure does. Yep. Yep. So, he's talking about the Lion of Judah. Now, when Jesus first appeared on the earth, he appeared as a lamb. And he was recognized all through the Old Testament as a lamb when thousands and thousands and tens of thousands of innocent little lambs were slaughtered to cover the sins of the people. And he, Jesus came as a lamb. He came gently. I know he had some moments when he could, you know, pretty much put people down with a word and things like that. But he was gentle. He he was he was very loving and and receiving and accepting. And so he was a lamb as he came. But when he comes again, he'll come as the lion. He'll come as a lion of Judah. He'll come in power, yes. wonderful power, and he will uh, he will destroy. Satan's army with his words and uh, he'll be he'll set up his kingdom on this earth and he'll be the lion of Judah at that time when he comes let's look where that name comes from because I think it's really interesting um, Judah now is one of Jacob's 12 sons right yeah. We, in fact, one of the lessons I taught, and I know you all remember every word that I taught in that lesson uh, a couple years ago, but it was on, it was on chapter uh, 38 of Genesis, and Jacob, he, he was a, I don't mean Jacob, Judah was a character. He was not a good man. He was not a good person in those days. And you read chapter 38, and I don't suggest you read it now, but Chapter 38, I mean, he, he just uh, had, he was immoral. And he even propositions a woman that turns out to be his daughter-in-law, you know, and has a baby with her and all this and that and goes on. And you look at his life and you say, Judah? You know, I don't know. But uh, in Genesis, if you have your Bibles, turn to uh, Genesis 44. Genesis 44. And see, this is years later now, and uh, Joseph is uh, uh, head of the, of the whole world. Joseph is the most powerful person in the world. They don't know he's Joseph. They come there to get food. They've had this whole interaction with Joseph. He sent them home, put the son's cup, and put their money back in their bags. And I have a feeling Joseph was really appreciate or enjoying what he was doing here, you know, to, to his brothers. Because he knew the end of the story. But um, uh, here is where Judah steps up. 
and becomes a hero. I love this. In chapter 44, they're standing before the most, the most powerful man in the world. They don't know it's Joseph. And here they are before him. And he's, you know, well, you, what do you do this and that? And if you're going to do this, I'm going to keep the youngest son's going to be my slave. And this, I love these words. Uh, the, in, chapter, in, in verse uh, 18 of the text. Now, this is ESV I got here. But uh, in the earlier versions, the one I really liked was it said, Then Judah stepped forward. He stepped forward. In front of the king of the world, Judah stepped forward. And he stepped forward to give his life for his little brother. It says in verse 18, Judah went up to him and said, Oh, my Lord, please let your servant speak a word in my Lord's ears and let not your anger burn against your servant, for you are like Pharaoh himself. My Lord asked his servant, saying, Have you father or mother? And he said to my Lord, We have a brother. And he went on and he told the whole story about, about what uh, has been going on there. And then dropped down to verse 30. And now therefore he's saying, as soon as I come to your servant, my father, and the boy is not with us. He's talking about Benjamin. Then as his life is bound up in the boy's life, as soon as he live, sees that the boy is not with us, he will die. And your servants will... As soon as he sees that the boy is not with us, he will die, and your servants will bring down gray hairs of your servant, our father, with sorrow to Sheol. For your servant became a pledge of safety for the boy to my father, saying, If I do not bring him back to you, then I shall bear the blame before my father all my life. Now, therefore, please let your servant remain instead of the boy as a servant to my Lord, and let the boy go back with his brothers. So that's Judah. To me, that's a hero. He's a hero. He's, he is becoming the lion of Judah. And then go back to chapter 49, which is when Jacob is giving his blessings to his boys. Yeah. And um, in, uh, I think it's around verse 8. Verse 8 of 29, or 49, 49, Judah's Genesis. Judah. Judah, your brother shall praise you. Your hand shall be on the neck of your enemies. Your father's son shall bow down before you. Judah is a lion's cub. You see that? From the prey, my son, you have gone up. He stooped down, he crouched as a lion, as a lioness who dares rouse him. The scepter shall not depart from Judah, nor the ruler's staff from between his feet until the tribute comes to him, and to him shall be the obedience of the peoples. It means uh, until Jesus comes, who will come in his line. And so Judah becomes the lion. And uh, Jesus is uh, named in that word, in, in them because he came through his kindred. And um, it's a beautiful thing. I, uh, when Judah was, when, when um, Jacob was dying, Judah's father, Judah, he says, Judah, your brothers will praise you. And he goes on to tell that story. So here's the thing. Here's the thing. In our world right now, there's no justice. There's no true justice. You all heard, you probably have relatives or friends or people you've known who things happen to them and it's wrong, you know, 
and there's no recourse. It never comes out in the end good, you know. This is our world that we live in because we have judges, you know, who can be purchased with money and all those kinds of things. And we have, uh, my wife and I have a very dear friend who uh, was a youth pastor and um, now he lives in Kansas and um, he uh, was working for a ministry, a missionary ministry. And it, you'd have to know him. I know him very well. M most folks don't know him real well. But he does what most ministers that I've known never do. So he, he goes down to the prison and he says, I'll take the prisoners that are coming out, the ex-cons. I'll bring them out and I'll give them jobs. And he talks to a developer who's developing a big seven or ten story building, old building that's full of junk. And he says, I'll put these men to work if you'll uh, finance us. And so he pays these convicts. They get, they get mon money that they can get a house and food and they can get begin to be on their own. And he said this, so the developer said, yeah, he says, I got some people working there. They've been six months on just the first floor and it's not even begun to be cleaned out yet. He says, my friend says, let my guys come in. His guys come in and eight days later, the floor is clear. And the guy says, oh, I want you. And so he starts going from floor to floor and he's hiring these ex-cons. He has a 90% success rate with ex-cons who are coming out. And uh, there are some who are not successful, you know. He's had his life threatened a couple of times. But he's doing a work. And then many of these ex-cons become born-again Christians. One of them, he talked about, became a minister. So he goes out to a small town away from the town he lives in, in Kansas. And he buys a piece of property with a rundown house on it. He brings his men out. And they rehab this house, and he turns it into a battered woman's shelter in this small town. Well, the, the leaders of the town, they don't want him there. And so every time my friend drives into town, they give him a ticket. He doesn't have to be speeding. He doesn't do anything wrong. They just give him a ticket every time he comes into town. He goes into the court and uh, pays a fine. As he's walking out of the courtroom, the policeman stands there and writes him another ticket for anything, you know. One ticket was because he uh, uh, didn't mow the grass. And he had mowed the grass, but that's just things made up and the tickets were piling up and he's getting hundreds of dollars of tickets and he doesn't have money, you know. And so in desperation, he goes to the church in town and there's a woman in the church who is a counselor. She counsels uh, people who are you know, need help. And he pours out his heart to this woman. He says, what can I do? And so the next time he comes into town, he goes into court. The policeman pulls him aside and he says, you see what you've done to me? My wife won't even let me sleep with her anymore. The woman counselor was his wife, was the policeman's wife. So now, so then they turn off the power in the battered women's shelter. The town does, and he can't pay it. And so one of his supporters comes out and said, "We'll pay for we'll pay the seven hundred dollars, whatever it is." And the judge says, "We won't turn it on anyway." So no, it doesn't mean you have to pay it. So here he's he's in this horrible situation. There is no justice. There is no justice, and it reminds me of the. You know, is it Luke 18, I think it is, where the widow says, uh, Jesus told the story that in a certain city there was a judge who neither feared God nor respected man. Isn't that great for a judge? And there was a widow in the city who kept coming to him and saying, Give me justice against my adversary for... A while he was confused, and afterwards he said, and Though I neither fear God nor respect man, you know, because they keep bothering me, I'll do it. But this is the way it is now. And I don't mean to be a downer. I don't. I'm being realistic about life. 
there will be justice. Amen. There will be justice. Amen. Because a lion of Judah will reign. And every wrong will be righted. And he will make things right. Yes. And um, this is our hope because of the Lion of Judah. And then um, in and, and, and Acts 17, remember when Paul was preaching, he said in Acts 17, he's talking about Jesus, for he has set a day for judging the world with justice by the man he has appointed, and he proved to everyone who this is by raising him from the dead. For he has set a day for judging the world with justice by the man he has appointed, Jesus Christ. And this is our hope. Verse 6, Then I saw a lamb that looked as if it had been slaughtered, but it was now standing between the throne and the four living beings, and among the 24 elders. Now, if you read the King James Version, which I read most of my life, they put this word in there, lo. Remember? You hear that word, lo? Jesus said, lo, I am with you always. Whenever you see the lo, the word lo, it means um, look, see, behold, observe. Pay special attention. Lo, and that word lo is right here. Uh, then I saw a lamb that looked as if it had been slaughtered, but in the King James it said, And lo, it was now standing between the throne and the four living beings and among the 24 elders. He had seven horns and seven eyes, which represent the sevenfold spirit of God that is sent out into every part of the earth. He stepped forward and took the scroll from the right hand of the one sitting on the throne. Now the word for that lamb that, that he sees in the vision is a little pet lamb. It's like a little, it's very innocent, very little. And um, it has the appearance of one that has been slaughtered. In other words, it's probably got his neck slit as he looks at it. it but he's alive. He's alive, and he is a resurrected Lamb of God. Amen? The resurrected Lamb of God. The seven horns mean power, because the horn is, in Scripture, always represents power. When he comes again, it will be with all-consuming power. Um, George, read Matthew 28, 18. And Therefore... Go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Teach these new disciples to obey all the commands I have given you. And be sure of this, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. Yeah, just before that he said, I, I didn't get, get it written down, but all authority is given to me. Remember? Yeah. Jesus said, all authority is given to me. So he has seven horns and seven eyes, which represent the seven horned spirit of God that is sent out into every part of the earth. And this means that he has all the fullness of the Godhead, um, as it says in Colossians. He has all the fullness of the Godhead dwelling in him. Here's this lamb that uh, represents the future and the, the power and the one who will rule. So he stepped forward and took the scroll from my hand. And that, that means that he has the authority to open those seals. And as you proceed into chapter 6, you see the seals being opened. Verse 8, And when he took the scroll, the four living beings and the twenty-four elders fell down before the Lamb. Each one had a harp. And they held gold bowls filled with incense, which are the prayers of God's people. So, if you were to look at the Old Testament and uh, the priest, and they go into the, there's two rooms, you know, the outer room, the inner room, and then behind the curtain, the Holy of Holies. They would go into the middle room, 
they would have this thing with a little bowl on the end of it and there'd be hot coals in there and they would go in there and they'd pour the incense on and the sweet smell would go up and the prayers of all people for all time are in those bowls. The prayers are there and the prayers go up to, to God. That's what that's about. Yeah. And um, uh, I believe that the bowls of prayer represent all of the prayers that have been prayed by all of the saints. And I believe personally that prayer, there are no prayers that are, that are missing. You know, that all of our prayers, and some of us I know feel sometimes like maybe our prayers are not being heard or that uh, they're, they're wasted. But every prayer goes up and is in the, uh, the heavenly place. And it's a real comfort to me to know that all the prayers that I've prayed in my entire life are there and none has been wasted. They're stored in heaven. And uh, that, that's how I see that. And that uh, not to be discouraged or get discouraged um, about your, you know, about your prayer, prayer life. Verse 9 says, And they sang a new song with these words, You are worthy. Now this is going toward Christ. You are worthy to take the scroll and break its seals and open it. For you were slaughtered and your blood has ransomed people for God from every tribe and language and people and nation. Amen. Imagine, just imagine for a minute, the whole globe, the whole earth, and all the all the very, you know, little places, islands, or places that might be far away that people have responded to God and become yes. born again and have been ransomed by the blood of Christ all through the ages. Uh, just imagine that. Um, that uh, his, his blood has worked in the lives of people throughout every generation. And they sang a new song. They sang a new song. I want you to read with me um, Psalm 33. If you have your Bible, uh, turn to Psalm 33. And I don't care what version you have. We'll have different versions. And let's read together out loud um, the first five verses of Psalm 33. I love Psalm 33 anyway because it talks about uh, God creating everything with His voice. But let's just look, begin with verse 1, and we'll read, read five verses, okay? 1, 2, 3, let's begin. Shout for joy in the Lord, O you righteous. Praise befits the upright. Give thanks to the Lord with the lyre. Make melody to Him with the harp of ten strings. Sing to him a new song. Play skillfully on the string with loud shouts. For the word of the Lord is upright, and all his work is done in faithfulness. He loves righteousness and justice. The earth is full of the steadfast love of God. Now, I don't know what your versions say, but it says there um, in the uh, third verse, Sing to him a new song. What do your versions say? Sing a new Similar. Song. Sing to him a new song. A praise to him. A loud noise. Yeah. And um, so, verse ten says, and as he continues to talk, and you have caused them to become a kingdom of priests for our God, and they will reign on the earth. He's talking about all the believers. Uh, have, will have been made become king, a kingdom of priests. What do priests do basically? What's their main job? Proclaim the word. Okay. Um, make intercession. Yes. They make intercession on behalf of other people to God. You know, they 
they're the priest. And uh, that, that's what we are called. And we make intercession for one, an for one another. Um, now, during the thousand year reign of Christ, which is mentioned in, especially in the 20th chapter of Revelation, it's called a millennium. Um, during that time, uh, you and I will reign with Christ. The Bible tells us that. We will reign with Him, which means we will rule with Him. And we'll be given responsibility throughout the entire earth to uh, be responsible for Christ. Uh, you know, Christ will be in Jerusalem and we will be doing our work on the earth. And um, in fact, look at, uh, if you got uh, your Bible open to the Revelation, look back to chapter 20 of the Revelation. I just want to look at one verse. Uh, Twenty is the one that talks about the millennium. But look at verse 4. Then I saw thrones. Do you all have it? Verse 4. Then I saw thrones, and seated on them were those to whom the authority to judge was committed. That's all the uh, Christian people who are have come back with Christ to uh, where, where he wins the battle of Armageddon and sets up his kingdom. So, I saw thrones and seated on them were those to whom the authority to judge was committed. And also I saw the souls of those who had been beheaded for the testimony of Jesus and for the word of God and those who had not worshipped the beast or its image and had not received its mark on their foreheads and minds. They came to life and reigned. See that word? That means to rule. Reigned with Christ for a thousand years during the millennium. So uh, that means that you and I here who are Christians will come back with Christ. Um, we will have responsibility on the earth uh, serving Him. You don't sound very excited or look very excited about that. Eh? I don't know, maybe you... Uh, it hasn't hit you yet, you know, what that really means. All right, verse 11. Then I looked again, uh, and I heard the voices of thousands and millions of angels around the throne and of the living beings and the elders. Now, there's, in the Bible, in the languages, there's no uh, word that specifically tells how many there are, because that's why you'll hear him say, um, thousands upon thousands and ten thousand. They're just saying there's no end to the number. Imagine that. Uh, I heard the voices of thousands and millions of angels around the throne and the living beings and the elders. He heard this. That must have been some sound. And verse 12 says, And they sang a mighty chorus, Worthy is the Lamb who was slaughtered, to receive power and riches and wisdom and strength and honor and glory and blessing. And uh, how many like the Messiah, musical the Messiah? It's my favorite. And uh, you hear he brings out this in that. But can you imagine the beauty of the sound of that chorus? But then look at verse 13. This is more interesting to me. And then I heard every creature every creature in heaven and on earth and under the earth and in the sea they sang blessing and honor and glory and power belong to the one sitting on the throne and to the lamb forever and ever yeah anyone Seven else thousand years in all right say it's really been good to be with you this morning yeah, and uh, we'll you're so uh, and quiet and sometimes I wonder if you're really <laughs> <laughs> but uh, it's always good to look at the word together. So you're dismissed.